Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Adam Golov, Marketing and Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we'll allow time at the web end of the webinar for questions and answers. So please write your questions in the chat areas they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we'll answer them, we'll make them available on our website. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Howard Schatz. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Howard Schatz, I'm, I'm the DCL's SPL project manager and uh, I've been with DCL since 1991 and active in SPL since its development began in 2003. Those of you who know the history of SPL know that officially it didn't start until 2005, but DCL was involved in its formative years when the FDA was reaching out to industry to develop the, uh, the standards. I'm an active member of the SPL working group composed of pharmaceutical companies and conversion vendors, and I'm the webmaster and frequent contributor to the SPL working group uh, wiki discussion forum. I'm on the establishment registration uh, slash drug team, drug listing, and the OTC sub teams. And, I've, and I have a BS in computer science from New York University and worked for EDS prior to joining DCL as, as an account manager there. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to go through the agenda. The first uh, Two slides are just going to be talking about DCL. This is what, what I call the word from our sponsor. But the remainder of the slides are going to be a presentation about what the new drug listing requirements are, going through what hasn't changed, explaining for those of you who've already heard about the blanket no change certification file, uh, what is in the blanket no change certification file. What is not included in the blanket no change certification uh, file, and also talk about the validation checks, a partial list uh, that you should be aware of for developing that. Uh, at the end, I will present a slide that has what I consider useful SPL links and FDA contacts, and uh, then we will have questions. Now, during the course of my slides presentation, I am expecting that there will be questions. So so send them to Adam and we'll, we'll take a brief break at, after each slide to see if there are any questions. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so first talking about DCL, we've been in business for over 35 years, successfully converting over a billion pages. Our focus uh, these days uh, are in XML related services uh, over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, and it, it, we are a privately held, woman-owned small business headquartered in New York City. While we are in many industries, if you've gone to our website, uh, you will see all the industries that uh, we're involved with. We do have a, t a staff here dedicated uh, to exclusively on SPL. In addition to SPL, obviously we have experience in other projects and in particular we have expertise in large complex conversion projects. We have substantial experience in managing multiple vendors for large scale projects with automated tracking and reporting of data throughout. So you can keep tabs on just what's, what's going on in your project. And we also have sophisticated quality control workflow with both automated and human quality control steps to guarantee accuracy. Our focus is on automated conversions, but we recognize there are limits to what a fully automated conversion can do. So you need to have a, a human set of eyes to make sure everything is running uh, smoothly and accurately. Next slide. Okay. In the life sciences area, we offer, uh, we offer SPL conversions and submissions. Uh, we also offer consulting and training. Even if you're not a client as for our conversion business, we do offer consulting and training. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Affordable Care Act requirement of drug separate reporting. We have a FDA 6004 drug separate reporting conversion and submission service. Uh, and we also uh, are involved with that to provide technical and compliance document management, document management consulting, and data conversion services. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay. <clears throat> the first slide focuses on the changes to the drug li listing requirements that became effective in 2017. Uh, the all the the new regulations require that all drug and active pharmaceutical ingredients listings must be done in SPL. If the last listing was submitted in paper prior to June 2009, you must submit the file as SPL. Uh, I say in 2017, but uh, there, there may be some leeway with the FDA in there. But uh, I would suggest that you go about getting your your uh, drugs listed. Um, and the other major change is that each existing SPL listing has to be either either be submitted during the year or certified as unchanged from the last listing. And I'll talk about more of that in detail as we go through the blank and no change certification, and we'll will clarify those things. Okay, um, assuming there are no questions at this point, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so certain things in the quote unquote new regulations really are not new, they haven't changed. The listings must be up to date, updated by the June and December following the change. That was always in the regulations, but what happened was the FDA figured out uh, by reviewing the drug listings, that a lot of these things were out of date. Uh, the attitude seemed to be, well, I listed my drug, I may have changed manufacturers, I may have changed content of labeling, but the drug is listed, so it's going to stay there. Um, uh, so th that is not what the FDA wants. They want their, their databases to have the most accurate information, and they want to get it from the drug companies. Uh, it, it used to be a brief history of SPL uh, from 2005 till 2009. The drug companies were submitting their SPL for only for approvals. Once approved, the FDA was then drug listing was then submitting the files to the Daily Med, and when they did that, they made some changes that the manufacturers weren't happy about. So the FDA, beginning with 2009, the decision was, we're not going to change anything. All the information that's in, in the FDA's databases on these drugs will come from the manufacturer. So you need to keep those up to date. Another thing that hasn't changed uh, is that discontinued drugs should be so indicated in the SPL. You can't just list the drug and let it stay there forever. If you've stopped manufacturing the drug, <clears throat> And it is, it, it, you should mark it in the SPL. In, in the SPL terms, that means you, the marketing status is complete. And the end marketing date, which is the expiration date of the last lot manufactured, is added to the information. So once delisted, no further, uh, the advantage is once you've delisted, no further certification is needed. So uh, that's actually a validation rule. So if you say a drug is delisted, the FDA will not let you certify it. There's no need to resubmit it at all once you've said it's, it's complete. Now, delisting means that you've stopped manufacturing and you've set an end marketing date. It'll, it's still on the market. It'll still be on the, end, on the daily med, for example, until that end marketing date is reached. All drug listings are the responsibility of the drug manufacturers, never the private label distributor. One of the points that the FDA made early on, uh, actually when they started re using SPL for drug listing, was that the responsibility for the FDA, FDA views, the responsibility for listing a uh, distributor's drugs lies with the manufacturer of that drug, not with the distributor. Uh, the reality is that distributors list their own drugs in some, in, in many cases. In other cases, the manufacturers list it for them. We have clients who are distributors only. They do not do any manufacturing, but they want to make sure their uh, their drugs are properly listed. So they do the manufacturer's listing as well as their own listings. Uh, and again, we have manufacturers who who do both. And we have manufacturers only do their own listing and the distributors do it. That sort of it's coordination between distributors and manufacturers. When the distributor is doing the, the listing, they are acting as the authorized agents for the manufacturers in the, in the view of the, of the FDA. Okay, uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next slide if there are no questions. 
Okay, so let's talk about the Black and No Change certification file. So it's a, I, I use the term a single file, uh, but elaborate a little bit. A single file certifying the product codes it contains are unchanged from the current listings. So if you have not submitted uh, the label to the FB, uh, for listing in a given year, starting with 2017, then you have to tell the FDA nothing has changed. The reason I haven't listed the label is that nothing has changed. So rather than listing, submitting each label just to satisfy the new rule, uh, the FDA is, or, is, is allowing you to use this blanket no change certification file where you can put in any number of product codes. It can be from a, uh, one label or code. They can all have they, there can be multiple label of codes in there, uh, but this file, by submitting this, that file, all the codes in there are being certified as, as unchanged from the previous listing. This file can only be submitted in the October 1st to December 31st timeframe, just like established re re registration renewals. You can make, to qualify for this requirement that you resubmit the label every year, you can submit at any time during the year, and once you make the first one submission during the year, that's in effect certifying the, the uh, that the current listing is is the most ac is is, ac is up to date. But if you want to not submit each individual label, but you rather would want to use the blanket no change certification file, you must wait until October first or or thereafter until December thirty first to send in this file. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, slide. Okay, so now let's talk about what is in the blank and no change certification file. And this is actually what I consider to be a, a very simple file. For those of you who have, who have been using SPL over the years, there's a lot of information that's required. Here it's very simple. There is an authorized agent. Now there is no, I haven't seen a legal definition of the authorized agent, uh, but uh, it basically it's somebody who's acting on behalf of a registrant, such as US agents, importers, consultants, or private label distributors. Any of those people can, can, can prepare this file. There is only one authorized agent included in the file. In other words, whoever is doing this is saying, I'm updating, I'm certifying that all of these product codes are unchanged. And all they do is provide the company name, their company name, the DUNCE number, and a contact. And the contact has to have a name, a phone number, and an email. Now, once you, that's, that's, that's a starting point. But then in that file, you list all product codes. Now that, now product codes means the labor code, product code combination that is, that is used for an NDC, along with the establishment names and DUNS numbers linked to the product codes. List each establishment once along with the product codes for it. Now, a, a key point here, again, when we're talking about distributors listings, the ones with the distributors label or codes. The, the distributors label code is linked to the establishment that manufactures the drug. So you, you don't, the, the distributor of the drug does not appear in there. It's not the, it's, uh, you don't have a, the, the done, uh, company name and does number for the distributor. You put in the company name and does number for the manufacturer. And then within that, you, you put in the product codes, uh, whether it's the distributor's uh, product codes or the manufacturer's product codes. The notes that I have here are that the, uh, the authorized agent can submit blanket, multiple blanket no change certification files. I called it a single file, but it's a file that contains a number of product codes, but a given agent can submit multiple files. So the, uh, the, it can, for example, submit separate files, one for each of its clients. If you're a, uh, if you're a consultant, 
and you have a number of different clients and you want to keep them confidential, uh, then you can submit a file with just a client's product codes. Now, why would you do that? If it's just going to the FDA for their purposes, well, if the, if the client wants to make sure that their product codes have been certified, right now the only way for you to verify, for the consultant to verify to their client that they have submitted it is to show them the file that they submitted. There is no um, site that will currently, that shows which, which product codes have been certified. So, um, so for those of you who are consultants or uh, importers or U.S. agents and you want to submit multiple files individually for each of your clients, that's fine. Now, another interesting thing that I find uh, uh, in the SPL world is that the FDA does not mind over-certification. So let's say you're a foreign manufacturer, you have a U.S. agent. Uh, you also have um, an importer. Uh, the importer, both the importer and the U.S. agent, can submit blanket no chain certification files that contain the, the same product codes. They don't care that two different agents are certifying the same um, the same product code. That's okay. And it is fine to include product codes included in labels that were already submitted that year. The way I view this is you can uh, set up a no chain certification file with, with all of your product codes, uh, and then you do update your labels during the year, but if come October 1st, you're not sure which labels you haven't updated yet, uh, so you just submit this blanket no change certification file with all of your product codes, and you're okay. The FDA does not uh, does not mind the double counting there, where you submit it during the year and you're certifying it at the end of the year. That's fine. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. Not seeing any. Uh, so. Um, uh, so let's move on. Okay, now here's a, a key thing. You know, I described this blanket no chain certification file. I described it as having all of your product codes. Well, that's not entirely true. Okay, we spoke before about delisting product codes. So once a product is delisted, do not recertify. It is a validation error in the, uh, if you submit a file that has a product code that is no longer uh, active and the marketing category is, is complete. So you need to, so in that uh, scenario that I described before where you have one master file, make sure you take out the product codes that have been delisted. Another thing is the expired product code. Now this is the concept of expiration, expired product codes is, is a new concept, uh, I think, for, that I, it's new to me. Um, and the FDA has described it as that. So if a label was not renewed one year, so now the new the regulations now say you've either got to submit the file or certify that it's unchanged. So if it has if neither has taken place, if you haven't submitted the file during the year and you haven't certified it by December 31st, as of January 1st of this year 2018, that that label that a uh, label will be removed from publication in the NDC directory and unfinished drug download files. They are also working on re having it removed from the uh, NSDE, the file used by CMS for drug reimbursements, and Daily Med, but those are different agencies, different parts of the government. So th uh, so the FDA uh, SPL people aren't saying that that's going to happen but they do control the NDC directory and the unfinished drug uh, download files. So they will take it out of there. And this is an automated process. Uh, one of the nice things about automated submissions is that things can happen very quickly. For those of you who have had input problems and they said you have to drug list the product uh, by the foreign manufacturer. So you go and you, you drug list it in SPL uh, and then within hours it's 
being populated throughout the FDA's databases, and you can now get your drug in. Um, by the same token, this would be very effective at monitoring expired listings. So what, come come January 1st, if it hasn't been recertified, it come it'll come out of those files. Now, once it's been taken out of those files, the own the only way to get them back into those databases is through a label submission uh, using a, a full label submission. In other words, you you got to get the set ID, increase the version number, and create a new document ID, even if it's completely unchanged from before. That's what you have to do to to get it to reinstated. The third category of product codes not to include are those with a known data deficiency. The FDA will contact manufacturers if they find data deficiencies in product listings, and until those data deficiencies are corrected, the product codes cannot be certified. Um, so if you get a data deficiency notice from the FDA, you better update your SPL in order to get those uh, products certified. Now, uh, I, one disclaimer I, I should have made at the beginning is that this displaying a no change certification process is uh, is for human drugs. There is going to be a separate process for animal drugs uh, that's handled by the Center for Veterinary Medicine, CVM. Uh, I had expected they would have trained us on that, but they have not. Uh, they will be uh, providing information on just how that will happen, but they will also be requiring certification. Okay. Uh, any questions yet? I'm not seeing any, uh, so let's move on. Okay, now <clears throat> there are validation checks for the blanket no change certification file. Most of them are technical in nature, um, and I therefore exclude it. The ones that I include here, which is just three, um, are the ones that are simple to explain and readily addressed. So the first item is that the establishment DUNS number that you include in the no change certification file must be for a currently registered establishment. So if you're a uh, uh, US agent and you have a foreign manufacturer uh, and somehow that manufacturer's registration lapsed, was not renewed, the establishment registration. When you go to submit this blanket no change certification file, you will get an automatic validation error and you will not be able to submit the file. You will have to remove it. Now I add again, product code for distributor, do not include the distributor DUNS number, the product code for the distributor is included of the establishment that manufactures the product for the, for the DUNS number. Uh, for the uh, for the distributor, okay. Now, um, product code must be for a human drug product API listed using SPL as a separate drug product. Do not include the product code if it is for a veterinary product, or a product code listed only as a component of a kit. Included if it is listed both separately and as a component of a kit. In, in other words, on that one is a little bit more complex for those who are not familiar with kits in the SPL world. But if you have a vial with a drug and that you package together with a vial for with a diluent, so something to, to mix with the drug, uh, and that's the only way to get that vial with the drug. Now that vial with the drug has a uh, has an NDC code, but you do not certify that. You're only certifying it as a if it's the kit itself or if it's available as a standalone product. So in other words, if you decide you will market that, that drug, that vial separately, then, then you do drug list that separately as a single component and you do certify that every year. Now, the other part of it is the validation check for the information that's required for uh, uh, for the authorized agent. You must have a company name, a company DUNS number, now uh, a contact name, a contact phone number, a contact email address. So all of those are required and if you don't have them, then, uh, then you will get a validation error. Okay, 
We'll move on so Howard, to the yeah. Howard, we, we have one question that's come in and it is does this apply to all drugs, including bulk and over the counter? Yes. I, I chose not to include all that, but this is any drug that is listed, whether it's an API, whether it's listed for those of you familiar with the SPL terminology, if it's listed as a drug uh, for further processing, listed as a uh, uh, as a manufactured under contract for a private label distributor, all of those items, all of those drugs needs to be listed every year. Uh, again, li li the labels, either the labels submitted or their product codes included in the blank and no change certification file for the manufacturer. So that that's an excellent question, but yes, this is for all human. Again, I just the only cav the only disclaimer is it's only for human drug products and APIs, not for veterinary products. That as far as a blank and no change certification. Great, Howard. And and then there's a follow up question: Is do you need to certify full finish and packaging establishments? Uh, repeat the question. Do you need to certify fill slash finish and pack and packaging establishments? Uh, yes, so packaging establishments are supposed to be registering mm -hmm. uh, the products that they package. Uh, you know, that's a it's actually a, a good question because you know, there, there is, they, they have the concept of a drug for further mm -hmm. processing, and that usually means that it needs to be packaged. So uh, the FDA has explained mm -hmm. that when if if a company just mm -hmm. manufactures a drug in bulk and doesn't pack it, you know, it ships it out in bulk mm -hmm. someplace for packaging, and then the packager is the one that packages it, labels it, and ships it to the distributor. They are shipping the the uh, although it sounds mm -hmm. a little bit unusual, but that, uh, ma that they're shipping a drug manufactured under contract mm -hmm. for a private label distributor. The company that's manufactured drug product in bulk is not doing that. They're just producing the thing in bulk. The company that, that ships the product that's ready for retail distribution, that's how it was explained to me, they're considered the ones that are manufacturing under contract, even though they didn't manufacture the individual drug. Great, thank you, Howard. And one last question that just came in is, <clears throat> if you are not the owner of the establishment, but it is used for your product, are you responsible for including in your blanket number, uh, in your blanket number change certification? Okay, the, 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 it's an excellent question. The short answer is no, but from a business perspective, I think this will require coordination because um, the manufacturers of the drugs are required to list their own drugs, right? Uh, so a packager uh, of a drug that's manufactured by somebody else is not responsible for the listing by the manufacturer of the drug. Uh, and similarly, you have US agents and, and importers uh, and the distributors themselves. They all have an interest in making sure that Product codes are certified, or at least resubmitted. Um, so, mm -hmm. using so, if you're concerned, you should feel free to certify the mm -hmm. the, the the listing as unchanged. Again, if you're let's say a packager or a U.S. agent, uh, but but uh, so, so you can so you can certify the information. Or you can just coordinate with with mm -hmm. the manufacturers to make sure that it's all being properly done. I mean, I can see what this is going to be an issue. I am anticipating this will be an issue uh, for for distributors mm -hmm. and manufacturers because the distributors want to make sure their drugs mm -hmm. are listed. Um, if they they can count on the manufacturer to do it, but what you know? How do they make sure that that happens? So mm -hmm. it's important that everybody talk to each other, and 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 again, you're free to uh, to act as the authorized agent if you have a vested interest in making sure that the product code is certified. 
Great, thanks, Howard. We have two more questions. We have two more okay. questions, and then we should start moving on. Uh, the next question is: Does a manufacturer have to certify a product that does not have the manufacturer's labor code? Well, okay. If the manufacturer is manufacturing for a distributor, mm -hmm. the manufacturer is the one that has to certify that. They're the ones responsible for certifying that 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 product code. Uh, they can ask the distributor to do it for them. But if it's not done, then the FDA will hold the manufacturer responsible for that. Again, but the key point is that a manufacturer is only responsible for the drugs that, that they manufacture. So in other words, the ones that they do that that use their label of code, again, the, the, the first part of the NDC is the label of code. So the, the manufacturer has a, has a label of code associated uh, with it. Um, and the, the distributors for whom they manufacture the drugs have label codes associated with them. So they are the manufacturers responsible for their own label codes and for the label codes of their distributors, of the distributors they manufacture for. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you, Howard. Um, the last question before we go to the next slide is. Should we expect validation errors for products that were submitted years ago? For example, validation error for revised UNII numbers or validation error for change in unit requirements? Right. Yes, they, they, th this is one of the reasons for certifying. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know what, the FDA hasn't said what they're gonna do, but you know, if you certify that something is, is unchanged, mm -hmm. You know, you certify this is unchanged, but the current listing has an invalid, well, mm. has a uni for an, uh, for an ingredient, or uses the name of an active ingredient that is no longer considered a valid name. Theoretically, they may say, the FDA mm. may say that that is therefore a, a mm. listing that needs to be updated. Um, you know, similarly, if you say a, a, a listing is, is current, is up to date, but it has a manufacturer in the establishment information. You have a manufacturer that is not uh, currently registered. They can very well, again, through the benefits of electronic listings, they can very easily identify those and, and contact uh, the companies. And this is where you'll get data deficiencies. Again, if, you're, if you have invalid information, if you have information that is no longer valid in the SPL world, that that's part of what I think the FDA wants in terms of getting the data accurate. Any Great, thanks, Howard. That one? Okay. Um, we we actually have two more follow-ups, but I, I I think we need to hit the next uh, to go to the next slide, and we'll just circle back. Okay. okay. Go to the next slide. Okay, now this slide presents useful SPL links and FDA contacts. Of course, there's a DCL SPL page. For those of you not familiar with it, there is an SPL working group. Uh, the SPL working group uh, was mentioned at the early part of this mm -hmm. presentation, and that's composed of, of manufacturers, people from the FDA, conversion, vendors such as ourselves, uh, so working together and discussing the issues with drug listings. Uh, they have a discussion forum there. Uh, it, it's free to, to join, uh, to, to participate in the discussions. As a webmaster, I, I get requests to specifically join the SPL working group, uh, and those are uh, mm -hmm always rejected because the only members quote of the SPL working group for the wiki are the ones that are responsible for editing the, the, the site. Uh, but the working group wiki itself is free to anybody to join. Uh, you have to join the wiki space. Uh, it's free of charge in order to participate in the discussions, but to just read the materials out of there, that's fine. Another, and this one I guess is maybe in terms of priorities, this is the most important one, is the FDA SPL resources page. Um, 
It has lots of useful links. You can go and find all of the different validation lists uh, uh, that the FDA uses. That's, that's all there. They have training sessions. Uh, we highly recommend uh, that you have that link in your uh, bookmarks if you don't already have it. Another one that we recommend is the Pragmatic Data Validator Lite. Uh, this is a publicly available site uh, that was worked, arrangement was worked out with the FDA. Uh, you can use it to both validate and view SPL. Um, if you try to view SPL file in Internet Explorer, um, because of security issues at your end and, and other reasons, technical reasons, it may not render properly. It may just look like a bunch of text unformatted. Uh, you go to this site, and we have DCL has no connection to, to pragmatic data, uh, but their site is free and it has a user interface that allows you to submit a file for validation and that validation will capture 90 to 95% of the errors that the FDA's validator will. Uh, and you can also submit the file there to view the SPL. Um, now these uh, the 5% or so, 5 to 10% of the errors that it does not catch are those that involve checking FDA's databases. Uh, I describe it as being validating the internal structure of the SPL files that you're mm -hmm. submitting, but once they have to check is this establishment registered, uh, has the data changed, then they have to go to the FDA's databases. So that that does not, it's not done by pragmatic data. That's the five to 10% of the errors that uh, you have to submit it to the gateway. Uh, Another useful contact, I'm sure many of you have used it, is spl at fda.hhs.gov. Uh, uh, the name you will always see when uh, coming from there is Lonnie Smith, uh, but he works, coordinates with the other parts of the FDA uh, to, to answer your questions, to address validation issues, and uh, requests for overrides. Uh, now, oh, and, and at this point, I should mention a, a, a tip that actually Lonnie Smith gave last week at, uh, at a working group meeting. Given the anticipated volume of overrides that will be requested at the end of the year, in order to have your product certified or, or updated or whatever by the end of the year, uh, submit them early before December 15th to see if there are any, uh, again, if you're submitting a label or, or even the nose change certification, mm -hmm. see if you get any errors and if you feel you need to request an override, mm -hmm. uh, that you have, it's justified for getting the override, mm -hmm. submit it before December 15th. Otherwise, with the volume of uh, work mm -hmm. that they're gonna be doing, plus the holidays, people are off, um, it may not, it may slip into the beginning of 2018 and that will cause all, problems with expiration dates and, uh, and, and whatnot. Okay, the, the next uh, address is uh, the edrls at fda.hhs.gov. That's the FDA Drug Registration Listing System Group. Contact them, and now I, I ask people, my recommendation is if you have regulatory questions, a lot of people who know Lonnie Smith who have used the SPL at fda.hhs.gov, they contact him and, and he does answer those, but uh, I, but he's also coordinating with EDRLS, so my recommendation is contact them directly uh, to, get, uh, to get a fast response. They're also useful if you want set IDs and version numbers. Um, as long as you're, they, they know that you're authorized to get that information, they will give it to you. Uh, I mentioned the Center for Veterinary Medicine um, so they they have an email address that they've set up specifically for questions, and that's called uh, that's askcvm at fda.hhs.gov. Okay, so those um, so for those of you who have a veterinary product that you want mm -hmm. to recertify, and you're wondering how am I going to recertify this, or do I have to submit the label again? Uh, contact them. Right now, the only way I know of uh, is to uh, send in your labels. Okay, uh, do we have uh, additional questions? Um, yes, Howard. So going back to slide 11, 
Um, we have two follow-up questions. The first one is, um, for more, uh, please, for more clarification on fill slash finish and packager, if the fill slash finish is listed on the on the 356 on the 356 mm -hmm. hour, is it still not required to be part of the blanket change? Could you could you repeat that one? Yes. Um, if the fill slash finisher is listed on the 356. It, it says H. I'm going to assume it's an hour. It's not. That's my oh, apology. Oh, okay. The 365 H. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. If, if it's a drug product. Right. If it's a drug product, it needs to be listed. If it's simply a device, it does not have to be listed. Great. And then the last uh, yeah. question has come in. <laughs> the last question has come in is, I have a question on drug listing requirements for the manufacturer who is never distributing with their labeler code. Only HTE distributor is distributing their old product using PLD, excuse me, using PLD label, labeler code. Right, right, okay, right, private label distributor labeler code, right. Okay, now the answer is, and this is, um, I'm assuming this manufacturer is, is a domestic manufacturer. Um, and the answer is the FDA wants them to list the drug. The FDA has had a very effective way for the last few years, uh, since 2011-2012, the FDA import, when, when a drug is imported into the United States, if the, the foreign manufacturer has not listed that drug, the drug will not come into the United States. So that's been very effective at getting foreign manufacturers to list their products. The FDA wants domestic manufacturers to do that as well. Um, now, how they will accomplish that, I don't know, but uh, but that is what they have always supposed to be doing, but they haven't been, uh, uh, you know, it, I, they haven't had a way of, of, of verifying that. So, um, so it is important uh, and that they list. So again, the the distributor has to have a manufacturer. The manufacturer should be listing that as the drug manufactured for a private label distributor, assuming that the manufacturer ships them a product that's ready for for distribution. If if they if they're manufacturing a product again, I talked about the packaging before. If they're simply ma uh, producing it in bulk and the distributor is having somebody else package the bulk uh, shipment, then, then the manufacturer is listing under the category of drug for further processing. Uh, this, this is a side point also. Uh, this is a drug listing issue that uh, uh, point that I want to make, given that I have the opportunity. Uh, the FDA wants, if you, if you, are, if you are shipping a, a drug product in bulk, they want you to use the, the product, the submission type, document type of drug for further processing and the manufacturing category of, man, of drug for further processing. They, uh, if it is simply an API, an agreement, an, an ingredient that will be used uh, in, to manufacture drugs, then what you do is you submit that as a bulk ingredient, the document type of bulk ingredient and a marketing category of bulk ingredient. Right now, you can do for drug for further processing. You can submit it as bulk ingredient, but that may be changing. The FDA may be changing those validation rules. But at the moment, I think you can do it both ways. Our personal practice for our clients is to do that as a uh, or it's automatically set to drug for further processing as both the document type as well as the marketing category. Great, thank you, Howard. The next question has come in is, <clears throat> for a virtual company who is not a registered drug establishment and who labels and lists a drug under their own NDC, would they be able to use the blanket no change 
or must they update their listing individually? Okay. Well, again, it's the responsibility of the manufacturer of that drug to list the distributor's label of code, either as a to submit an updated label or to include it in a blank and note change. But as the authorized agent, the distributor can include it in the blanket no change certification file. So in other words, the manufacturer may be doing it for them, for the distributor, but if the distributor wants to be sure, they can either speak to the manufacturer and get some reassurance or ask them for the blanket no change certification file that they submitted, or they can do it themselves. It's, 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 it's up to them. You know, I, I know for the national distributors, uh, we have clients that are manufacturers for national distributors, uh, and the national distributors are instructing their manufacturers that they will do all of this SPL work for them, that the distributors are not doing any SPL listing. But that's on the national level, and they can do that. But I know, again, from my, our own experience with our own clients, the distributors are doing it on their own, and sometimes they're also doing it for their manufacturers. Court, you guys work it out. Thank you, Howard. The next question has come in, it's, it's rather long. Um, is the FDA going to provide a list of NDC numbers that will be removed from the NDC directory before this happens, or will we find out after the fact? I, okay, the, what, what information they have given so far, and it's all, and whatever information they're given is subject to change if they so decide, uh, is that if you've received a data deficiency notice, you are you are on notice now that it w assuming you're you're attending this webinar or you've been on other webinars, you you're being told now that if you have a data deficiency notice, don't even think about uh, about including it in a blanket note change certification. It will expire. Uh, so, uh, whether they will, what formal contact they will have, uh, they, they haven't said, uh, if they will be notified. They are sending out, I, I did see, uh, I stand corrected. I just got an email from, from a client yesterday. Um, uh, apparently they're in their email exchange, the FDA's email exchange with the client, uh, they're saying that they're, sending out you know, notices, you know, re they're sending out reminders, these blanket reminders that you should be listed, or you should be updating. Um, uh, so, uh, so like we've been telling you to do this, so, so do it. But whether they'll formally notify you in advance, I, I, I don't know, and I, so uh, they have not said that they would do that. Thank you, Howard. The next question has come in is, are you expecting a lot of validation errors for older products? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, as the earlier question mentioned, there there will be issues with validation number, uh, I'm sorry, not with, with unique ingredient identifiers, the unis and, and ingredient names. Um, for older products, um, you know, they, you know, over the years they've, put in all sorts of validation rules. So it used to be that if you had a drug powder that was in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a liquid, the strength of the drug powder was mentioned as, uh, of the active ingredient was given as milliliters per milliliter or something like that, per, uh, I should say milliliters per liter, um, whatever the, the, the strength was. But uh, three years ago or so, they put in a validation check that the, the strength of an active ingredient that's not uh, that's not a liquid uh, must be expressed as milligrams per milliliters or per liter. So all these drug powders that may have been listed in 2012 as you know five milliliters per hundred milliliters, um, they'll now if they resubmit those, they have to resubmit them as, for argument's sake, I don't know what the 
fact, mapping is, but five milligrams per um, per hundred milliliters or something like that. So yes, there, there, I am expecting that if you if you haven't updated since probably 2013, you'll undoubtedly get. I'm, I'm almost certain you'll get that validation error. Uh, and also make sure this is this is a free tip here. Um, if you have an old listing and you're updating, you're making sure you've got all the, the unis right and everything else. Also make sure that the manufacturer is currently registered with the FDA. Uh, you know, it could be, and, and this is where the SPL file has a lot of information that is decided at different parts of the drug company. So and I remember one story when when the uh, we had a new client for SPL. This goes back to about seven years. He said, "So you mean if I get if if, if somebody in accounts uh, pay up besides they can save a penny a tablet by switching manufacturers, I've got to know that me and the regulatory department has to know that so I can update the SPL listing." And I said, "Yes, <laughs> that's what the FDA wanted." But once the drug was listed, if you didn't relist it, you had no problems. But now with this concept of relisting every year, if you do submit the label, the manufacturer has to be registered. So check the Decker site, um, the Drug Establishment Current Registration site, um, uh, to make sure they're currently registered, if you have any doubts about that. Um, and so, so do check to make sure all of that information is is correct, and make sure they're using that manufacturer. Great, thank you, Howard. The next question has come in is, well, D, is DCL going to provide an updated workbook for clients to create this listing? Right. Yeah, we're go, we're going to provide a a, a worksheet, a separate worksheet. Uh, well, actually, we may end up putting it into the current workbook, but we're finding that the current workbook has a lot of tabs in already. But yeah, to provide the blank and no change certification file, you'll fill out a spreadsheet with the authorized agent information, and for each establishment, you'll list all their product codes, the Dunn's number for the establishment, and their product codes. You'll enter that, and uh, we, will, we will be having that in, in the early part of November. Great, thank you, Howard. <clears throat> the next question is a little bit long, so please bear with me. Um, if the manufacturer is in the US and the drug listing has been done by its distributors with their labeler code, whether it is required by the manufacturer, also list their product with the manufacturer's labor, labor, labeler code as well? Wait, the, the, so you're saying that the, the, the drug is being manufactured offshore, overseas. I'm not sure I understand the question. If it's being manufactured overseas and being shipped in as a completed product, then the foreign manufacturer is listing uh, uh, it's listing the um, it's listing the drug as a manufactured under contract. So I'm not sure what role the domestic manufacturer is playing in here. Um, bear with me. The, manufa the manufacturer is domestic. They're in the U.S. Right, but they said it's being manufactured. It's being manufactured. You said something about a foreign manufacturer, didn't you? Bear with me one second. I'm just re-looking for the original question. Okay. If, no, if the man... The, the original question is, if the manufacturer is in the U.S. and the drug listing has been done by its distributors with their labor code, whether it's required by the manufacturer, also list their product with the, with the manufacturer's labor code as well. Oh, okay. From the nature of it, I assumed, I guess. Uh, so the subsidiary of the manufacturer has listed the, dr the drug. So the manufacturer then has no need to to list that drug right in other words is this thing a subsidiary that manu a subsidiary manufactured the drug
I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Howard? Yeah, so the thing is, subsidiary listed the drug mm -hmm. in what role, I guess, is my question. I'm just waiting to see if the person who submitted that question will come back around. Um, uh -huh. But with that, let's just go to the next question. We could always come back to that one. And the next question is, mm -hmm. a manufacturer may have submitted an abbreviated listing without contents of labeling. They are required to right. update that listing annually, correct? Right. And the distributor with the full listing would be required to do the same. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the last part of the question was? And the, and the distributor with the full listing would be required to do the same. Is that correct? That, well, it's a matter of terminology. Well, uh, let, let's back up a minute. So the, the, the manufacturer listings do not need to have any content of labeling. They just need the package images and the drug product information. Mm -hmm. The distributor listing is the full listing with the content of labeling, the package insert, the drug facts, what have you, along with the drug product information and the, and the package images. The manufacturer is the one responsible for making sure the FDA views the manufacturer as responsible for for the, both their listing and the distributor's listing. So, but both of those listings have to be updated annually. I think that's the question. Do they both have to be updated, the manufacturer's listing as well as the distributor's, and the answer is yes. Great, thank you, Howard. There's several more questions. The next one is, where can I get the worksheet or blanket no change certification file? Okay, we will be distributing that uh, uh, the first week and first full week in November, and we'll we'll send out a uh, a link to where you can pull it off the SPL file. Now, for those of you who are do-it-yourselfers, I want to read the implementation guide, and I will freely tell you, um, although I'm presenting this to you as you know, I'm pre presenting this as an educational webinar. Um, and we would like you to use DCL for those changes, but Cedar Direct is now is now working. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Cedar Direct, that is a free tool that the uh, that the FDA offers, where you can set up all all the all sorts of SPL files, mm -hmm. any type of SPL file, you can uh, submit it through them, um, and they have it working now, so that uh, the blank note change certification will work. Can be done through that, but again, we hope you'll be using DCL for those for that. Great, thank you, Howard. And the last question that's come in is: It is difficult to comprehend the potential number of validation errors in manual overrides. Presently, manual overrides can take the FDA up to two months to address. Do you think this time frame will take even longer? Since we expect many validation errors. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that, is the the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The longer answer is the tip that I gave earlier, which came from Lamy Smith of the FDA, that they are anticipating that given the volume of validation errors, I you know if I, I said December fifteenth, maybe if you could do it December first or November fifteenth, even better. Um, um, the main my overall tip with any SPL file is do what you can to make sure you don't get validation errors. Um, you know, some of them are legitimate. Uh, I mean, in other words, when I say some of them are legitimate, um, if you change, if the regulations require, for example, if you change the imprint on a drug, the product code has to change. So if you submit a new listing for that drug and you have, Put in the new imprint on it, put the same NDC number, you'll get a, a validation error uh, because you change the product characteristic of imprint. That is, 
the regulations say you've got to change the product code. So, you know, you can ask for an override, but um, that, you know, I would expect they would not do that because in that case, you've changed the product characteristic. If you had submitted, on the other hand, we do tell clients who get those types of errors that the change in the product characteristic was causing the error. If you are correcting the information, in other words, if the if the uh, imprint uh, used to be um, A B uh, A B C was was the imprint on the tablet, and somebody discovered, oh no, that's not what we're printing on the tablet. We're printing A B D on the tablet, and you now correct and so you're now correcting the information. So in other words, you you change the product characteristic and the drug product information in order to make it accurate. So the product itself hasn't changed, but the drug product information has. So in those cases, we tell clients request an override explaining that you that you are correcting the information. They are they are willing to do, those they are willing to abide by. But if you're if you're violating the regulations, that's a different story. That may be uh, they may not be so quick to give you a uh, to give you an override, and yeah, and keep in mind apropos to that question about override. Once you request an override, they're going to look at everything that's in that uh, that's in that uh, listing, and they may find other issues with with what you have. Uh, they, they may look at the, at the package image, for example, and say, well, it's not it's not legible. We want you to get a better package image, something like that. So they may have you correcting other things. And that's one reason why manual overrides can take a while, not just because of the volume of overrides, but because of what they do at their end, at the FDA's end, where they're viewing not just your particular request for an override, you know, the product characteristic change. So you want to know, can I override that? They have to look at everything that's in the label and correct it. So, yeah, the sooner you get your listings in, the better off you are. and uh, because yes, the, the, a high volume of overrides are expected to be requested, and therefore, it, they will take time. And the clock is ticking down to January first. Thank you, Howard. The next question has come in: Is how long does it take to complete the renew of drug listings after the file is submitted? Hmm. Well, as long as it passes automatic validation. Uh, it happens within hours. I mean, we've we've had, I mean, uh, we've had people uh, you know, submitting files on a weekday afternoon, and mm -hmm. the next morning they're up on Daily Med. So, I mean, yeah, and Daily Med is not the drug listing, right? The, the, the mm -hmm. drug listing is within, is, is within the uh, FDA. So it's it's happening, and you know, and again, you know, I go back to the mm -hmm. the. Uh, the experience we've had with with import issues, when I mean, the issue was a drug wasn't listed, so you 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 get a drug listed, and within hours it's it's there, and the, and the import officer uh, will do it. Now, oh, uh, and and that also leads me to another side point here, but that came up in last week's working group meeting. Um, the for those of you who are importing drugs. And then this concept of expired drugs, and what does the expired drug mean? Uh, the the FDA explains that the the customs officers interpret the the rules as they see fit. So what exactly they will do if if it's expired, if the drug is coming into the, in the United States and it's now expired, whether they will allow it, that's that's going to be up to the customs officer. But be aware that a lot of these issues that they have in, in import is being decided maybe not following strict SPL validation rules, but but the interpretation by uh, by the customs officers. So uh, so again, it gets back to the fact that given this January 1st deadline, uh, do what you can to, to meet it. You don't you don't want your drugs expired when they come into this country. Thank you, Howard. <clears throat> the next question is a follow-up from an earlier question, and it states, um, hi, Howard, your, your answer is not clear. 
if the drug product manufacturer is located in the U.S. and the yeah. drug listing of its products have been done by its distributors only with distributors label or code, whether oh. it is required by the manufacturer also lists its products with a manufacturer manufacturer's label or code as well. Okay, and 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 the answer the the short answer to that one is yes. The manufacturer needs to list with with their uh, with their label of code. You know, create an MDC with your label of code. That's that's the way it's always supposed to have been working. And um, whether or not they'll be able to do anything to enforce it for domestic manufacturers, uh, we'll we'll find out. But that is the FDA's position that everybody in the in the in the drug chain, from the API manufacturer to the bulk manufacturer to the to the packager to the labeler repackager, uh, they're all supposed to be listing their uh, their drugs. Great. Again, only Thank the you, drugs Howard. they're responsible. Yeah, and I just I hasten to add, but just the ones that they respond the label their label code. And their distributors label code. That's that's the extent of what they're responsible for. And and, and the only distributors you. only if they if they make the final product. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Um the last question that's come in is for existing DCL customers, would the no change certification form be provided to clients? Or does it need to be requested from DCL before December 2017? No, we'll be sending out a link, uh, so you'll be uh, downloading it from, you know, just like you do for our current SPO workbook. Download the uh, download it from our website and and fill it out. Great, thank you, Howard, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. This will conclude today's broadcast. You'll be able to access the recorded version of this webinar in the webinar archive section of our website located at www.dclab.com. Our next webinar will be Tuesday, October 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time titled Trends, Insights, and Surprises, Digital Publishing Survey Results Revealed, being presented by Devorah Ashlam, Senior Project Manager at DCL. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.